Okay, so the planned subject of today, lesson three, Astea, which is the third Yama we are learning. It's about not stealing, refusing to go along with theft. It's based on the same principle as the previous two Yamas. It's not as simple as it looks. When you go to the supermarket and you take an apple from the grocery department, from the vegetable department, and you pass by the cash register without paying for that apple, that is very clearly theft. But there are many forms of theft, and we very often commit theft on ourselves and our loved ones also. So we have to have a look at that a little bit. First of all, like with violence, violence is easy to recognize because of pain. But then we notice that there are many subtle forms of violence accompanied by subtle forms of pain that we often do not recognize as such. So we talked about that. Violence, you recognize by pain. Uh, lying, you recognize by a nasty taste in your mouth. You feel when people lie. It's the same with stealing. An experienced detective, an experienced police officer, recognizes the criminal without the criminal actually committing an act. Because they feel the energy, the distortion in that person's energy. So you have, in the downtown of Amsterdam, for example, there's a lot of drug trade going on which attracts a lot of small criminals, petty criminals, people who rob people, steal from shops and what have you, break into cars, houses. So there are specialized teams of police officers that behave like tourists. They walk around the streets, downtown, backpacks, jeans, looking like tourists, and they're just observing. And they, they always pick out the criminals. Not always, of course. They're not always there at the place where the criminals are. But they're very skillful and very successful at intercepting those people before they actually go wrong. Of course, the law is such that if somebody hasn't done anything, you can pr prosecute them. So they just follow them until they commit a crime, until they steal something or rob somebody. And then they intercept and put them into a cell, the process of prosecution. So theft is also something that you feel. Why is this important? Because if we commit theft, whether that is uh, in ways that we don't recognize, or very obvious, stealing things, robbing, and so on, it's like with lying, people feel subconsciously. They feel that there's something not right about you. It's the same issue as with lying. People don't trust you. It means that people do not want to associate with you. When you need help, because you're going, you have a good idea, a nice idea about starting some kind of venture with a brilliant new invention, you need other people, you need investors, you need, uh, 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 you need people who, uh, who uh, support you, who help you. People don't want to work with you if they feel something is off. But with theft, as with the other yamas that we discussed, there are many forms of theft that we don't recognize. Because it is accepted, because it is subtle. For example, copying a program for your computer. Technically, that's theft. Because the creator of that program put in resources to develop that program and to put that program into the market. So technically, that person deserves to be paid. Just like when you write a book, Every book that is being sold in the bookstore means 
one dollar into your bank account, so you sell a thousand books, you earn a thousand dollars. But then people start copying your book. Ten thousand books, hundred thousand books, but you're not getting what you deserve. The same with modern technology, with computer programs, of course, or music, for that matter. Practicing non-stealing means that we simply try to pursue to be as honest as possible. You don't do that for the creator of the material, you do that for yourself. And like with non-lying or being truthful, the difficulty here is again that the easy way is simply to just what everybody else does. The yogi way is to refuse to go along with that just because everybody else does it too. But it means, at least in the beginning stages, it is the difficult way. It's not easy to always be truthful. It's not easy to always be honest in terms of non-stealing. But in the end, it always pays back. Sense of dignity and self-respect for being straight, for being principled, but also earning the respect from the people around you. And eventually, in a material sense, that people actually ask you to be involved in their business or want to be involved in what you are doing and support you and help you to grow in that way. The world, however, is also constantly changing. A library is an institutionalized form of theft. But there are justifications for a library. Why did we start printing books? Because those people behind the invention of printing books, their passion and purpose was to spread knowledge. They wanted to make the world a better place by giving people access to books. Now books, of course you write a book, you want the people to buy that book so that you can earn a living and pay the bills. And maybe write another book after that. But why is a library justifiable? People can access your book a hundred times. You could have earned a hundred dollars if they would have bought your book instead. But it's very likely that they would never have bought that book. They have easy access at the library. So for the whole of mankind, the institution of a library is a positive thing, is a good thing. If, as an author of a book, you understand that, and your intention of writing books is also pure, you can only support that. Because in the end you write a book to inform people. And the more people you can inform, the better. Same with yoga. I think what I ask you to pay for this course is a huge amount of money. And yet other courses are two, three times as expensive. I just cannot imagine how people dare to ask such a huge amount, but they do. But my purpose is to have as many people as possible. If this course is four million one, there, there would be three people here in the room. What is that about? And last week somebody contacted me and said, hey Ron, sorry, I'm a little bit too late, but I shared some of your files with a friend. She was a bit distraught and she said she really found solace in it. She really felt helped by reading it. So is it okay that I share it with my friend? So I said, you know what, I really appreciate that you ask, but I know that my students share the files with their friends without asking me, so at least you ask. So go ahead. 
if your friend is helped by that, then at least uh, it has fulfilled its purpose. Go ahead, do. Maybe even that person will someday decide to become a student. Now, music. The world has changed. In the past, you had to buy music in a shop. <laughs> MP3 players didn't exist. I, I was born in the time that uh, CD players didn't even exist. We had uh, vinyl discs, so you couldn't you couldn't just skip from one song to another or somewhere. You had to take off the needle and be careful not to damage. <laughs> <laughs> or you know these cassettes that you always they always end up so with the pen you are <laughs> winding up your cassette younger generation that uh, have no idea <laughs> I'm talking about the older generation laughing with me so much has changed but in the past you went to the record shop and you bought your uh, favorite music now you go to your computer you can download you can it's free. Uh, there's something interesting happening here. Some of the artists that you admire, that you look up to, suddenly they are in the news because they have started, they sue. They sue a company like YouTube or Google or what have you, or they sue an organization. Somebody used their music without paying author rights and what have you, the intellectual property rights. There are several things at work here. The person that you looked up to appears to be greedy and not so open-minded and generous and what have you as you believe that person to be. That person falls off their pedestal. Actually, you're not interested in their music anymore now that you know who they really are. That's one thing. But there is a dynamic at play here that leads to income through another way. The, everything has changed. I give you an extreme example. That is the Korean singer, Psy. You know Psy? Gangnam style. Yes. This guy has never complained about people illegally downloading his music and it is his most popular song has been watched three billion times. It broke all the records on YouTube for free. He never complained that he didn't receive any like intellectual property rights or whatever. But you know what happened? Instead, you saw his image in the subway, on the bus, on the billboards, on TV. All the Korean brands wanted to have him as his ambassador. Instead of selling his music, he earned money in that way. YouTube also pays you for, uh, uh, if you have a, a big amount of views, then they, they pay uh, uh, for commercials that they, that they uh, insert into your videos. So the world has changed. You have to put some nuance in here and see the bigger picture. Uh, technically, theft, if the intention is not pure, then it leads to negative repercussions in the end. So, that is about the most obvious form of theft. We also steal from ourselves. How do you steal from yourself? By having high expectations of yourself. Having high expectations, unreasonable expectations, unrealistic expectations of yourself, and we all have that. Everybody wants to be successful, everybody wants to be wealthy, Everybody wants to have their ideal house and what have you. It's a form of theft to demand more from yourself than you can achieve, reasonably can achieve, or can handle. 
complicated? No, do an asana. All the yamas that we learn, you can directly apply to asana. If you do not know yet how to apply it in daily life, practice asana. If it hurts, that's the violation of ahimsa. So asana is not supposed to hurt. When it hurts, it means that you are also lying to yourself. You're pushing your, your, yourself beyond your boundaries based on the idea that you can do that. That's a lie. And it's theft that you are expecting yourself to be able to do something, a pretzel pose, a difficult advanced yoga pose, without many years of practice. So when you practice asana, try to incorporate the yamas and the niyamas. I told you last week already, be your own best friend. That will get most of it done. And if you want to do pretzel pose, I can do pretzel poses, you know, but almost effortlessly. Why? Because I practiced yoga for almost 40 years. It's something that develops gradually. <coughs> But when you buy a yoga book from a popular, uh, uh, popular yoga teacher, who is usually an ex-gymnast or an ex-ballet dancer, who is super physically developed, super flexible and strong, you buy a book from the shop, you want to learn yoga, you have no experience or only short, then you see this person and you have to turn the book upside down because you have no where the, the idea where the beginning and the end is. And you think that you can do that pose too, that is a form of theft from the author of the book, but it's also a form of theft from yourself. It's unrealistic to expect that. Unless you have been a professional ballet dancer or gymnast yourself. So where it comes to yoga, we are doing it here in a class setting. But the most ideal way is that you do it at home, on your own, with no one around. Because the, the way that you approach your asana practice is subconsciously totally different when you are alone. When you are alone, you're not afraid to make mistakes, to be imperfect to be foolish or funny. But as soon as you know that there are people around who see what you do, you're self-conscious and the chemistry is totally different. There is a tension there that is not there when you're alone. Practice alone and enjoy most of all what you do. When you enjoy something, you experience pain, you immediately know that it's not right, that it's not correct. But while people are watching and you experience pain, you do the opposite. You clench your jaws and you grind your teeth and you say, <laughs> So be aware of that. Most of all, play with that. Sometimes just be a clown. <laughs> it's very relieving in a way, especially with other people around. It makes energy flow again. It's the purpose of comedy, in fact. So don't take your practice too serious. But that sounds funny, because on the other hand, I tell you to practice more often. <laughs> <laughs> so instead of saying don't take your practice too serious, I should say don't take yourself too serious. When you practice. But then again, that extends to everything else in life. Stealing in words, page two. When people ask you a question, you have a holy duty to give a reply. Remember we talked about Namaskar. It's not about 
the action. It's about being sincere when you greet people, when you say good morning, or how do you do. When somebody asks you how do you do, and you ignore that, which we usually do habitually, because subconsciously you think that person doesn't care how am I doing, but actually, technically, when a person asks you how do you do, there is a duty to answer that question, sincerely. So it becomes a little bit complicated here, right? Because the way, accepted ways in society, everywhere, in the workplace, in school, in the family, etc., with neighbors, is that we constantly lie and steal in terms of interaction. So just be aware of that. Don't try to be perfect, but more and more try to not go along with that anymore. When somebody asks something, that's why also, you send me a text message or you send me an email, always reply. Is that strange? Yes, it's strange. There are many, many people who don't. But it's theft when somebody asks you something and you don't reply, even if it's obvious. It may be obvious to you, but not to that person, or that there is a reason why they ask. So you try to understand that and, and give the proper response. There are many yogis also, because they're yogis, when you ask them something, their answer is always very mysterious. I think that is impure. But that's kind of an accepted way of, of, of spiritual people to, to communicate. I think it is impure. Somebody asks, you just need to reply. No, no deviations or mysterious uh, uh, double-bottomed uh, replies that people have to draw their own conclusions or what have you. This is a kind of arrogant, I think. So that is, that is a form of theft. Somebody asks how you do you do, start answering that question. Or at least if you say, I'm fine, mean it. If you had a really rotten day, do not say, oh, I'm, I'm fine, <laughs> because you're not. So you can, maybe you can say, oh, so-so, <laughs> so-so, could be better, something like that. And you see this also in terms of relationship. The partner, you come home from work and your partner asks you, how, how was your day? And you kind of feel annoyed. Why? I just want to put my bag down and, and uh, take a cup of uh, tea and relax a little bit. And my partner asked me, well, how was your day? Should I explain everything to my partner? But your partner shows some interest there. This is what happens if you don't reply. And you can see this in many relationships that are long term. In long-term relationships, people don't ask anymore. Why? Because it happened several times that you asked and the reply was insincere or ignored. The next time your partner comes home or you come home, your partner doesn't ask. But this is how it works. Everything has a consequence and it always cause an effect at work. Play with this concept. Try to apply it as best as you can. Do not, do not overdo it, because that is a little bit awkward in the society that we live in, but more and more try to be as direct, as honest as possible. Do not deny people an answer when they ask, whatever situation that is. Very often when we ask something, people also have a tendency to make us feel stupid. In the way, they will answer the question, but in the way that they do, it's like, huh, what a stupid question you ask. The way that they answer is, it's so obvious. No, if people ask, it means there is a reason. There is a, a valid reason they ask. And take that serious, no matter how simple it is or how obvious it could be. That is, from your point of view, it's simple or obvious, but not always from the other person. So that's a form of theft, though. Take it serious. And uh, there's a situation I'd like to share with you, I do with every class, because it shows how complicated things can be. At 
the very beginning, when I started teaching this course in the way that we have developed it, we had a guy in the class, and when we were talking about this subject, he said, Ron, I have a colleague, he's single, but I know that he is having affairs with at least three married women. And the way that he was talking about this, he was really upset about it. So he said, you know what, based on what we learned today, I, I am really inclined to, um, I'm going to contact these, uh, the husbands of these women and tell them what's going on because this is totally inappropriate. So I reflected a little bit on that situation and his, uh, his emotion and I told him, okay, before you, before you do anything, first imagine what will happen if you do what you just said you are going to do. Being honest and not withholding knowledge from these families involved. But I said, try to imagine what will happen if you do what you intend to do. You will be responsible for marriages breaking up if you do what you intend to do. You will be responsible the cause of children involved being traumatized for the rest of their life, being hurt. And then I had an epiphany and I said, Greg, look inside yourself also first. Why are you so upset about this guy? Isn't it possible that you're also a little bit jealous? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a man and, you know, I can imagine that you could envy a guy like that who so easily seduces women having affairs especially if you yourself are not that easy or if you're shy or and so it's a very interesting conversation he never of course did what he at that moment thought he was going to do it's again you can be totally honest but that also means compromising the previous yamas that you learned you can become a bull in a china store you can cause a huge amount of damage unintended of course because you didn't see the whole picture yet you can cause a huge amount of damage thinking that you were doing the right thing That means you always have to look at something from various angles. Always, before you do or say anything, first contemplate. Try to see the lines of where it is possibly going if you do what you are about to do. Try to vi vi envision, try to envision what could possibly happen as a result of that. If it doesn't feel right inside, better don't do anything at all until you have a clear conclusion about it. So again, you see, life of a yogi is not easy. <laughs> In fact, <laughs> it's rather complicated, but <coughs> it's all about life. You will feel more and more connected than ever before and everything starts making sense. And you wake up every day with the feeling I'm so happy to be alive. Life is wonderful. In spite of the struggles that you're going through. You feel like coming home. Doing the right thing. And doing the effort that you need to put in. It seems exhausting. On the contrary. You clean up a lot of clutter. Subconscious clutter. That is, that is disturbing 
and distracting your life from what it really is about, from the essence of what it is all about. And that in itself leads to more sattva. Because all that clutter, especially subconscious, all the inner conflicts that fight their wars, their wars internally, they do not allow you to be in sattva and therefore they keep your consciousness down. Do you follow the news a little bit? I do. Just naturally, as a yogi, as a more... Yogi is also a superficial word, actually, but as a person who's more conscious and sensitive, you automatically become more interested in what is happening in the world. You want to make the connections, you want to understand the world that you're living in. I feel a lot of resistance these days to watch the news. Why? Because all these yamas are being violated haphazardly, wholesale. There's so much lying, deliberate lying, which is worse than when it's unintentional or subconscious. Deliberate lying. And deliberately holding the withholding the proper information from people. So I find myself more and more switching channels to just look at something that is less disturbing because all that, and that shows also that, that the philosophy of yoga was right to address these issues because if you want to be more peaceful, you have to eliminate all the disturbances and disruptions. And that starts with your inner functioning, addressing non-violence, non-lying, non-stealing, and what follows. On the other hand, I hope you also understand that the situation that we are in now is temporary. Not only that, Bad things always lead to progress. So in my opinion, always life is a process, whether it's personal or societal, global even, two steps forward, one step back. Without the one step back, there is never two steps forward, so the setbacks are simply necessary. It's disturbing, it's hurtful, disruptive, what have you, but it leads to more consciousness. It leads to new changes. I hope that you can see the world in the same way so that it doesn't influence you in a negative way. Even though it is negative what is happening, try to have the insight, the vision that it will lead to new developments, necessary developments, change. The world is simply divided into good and bad. Good always prevails. The light always prevails. But is limited by the yamas and the niya. The forces of good in this world are limited by the universal laws. Evil is not. So evil is direct deep impact, causing mayhem in a short term. The forces of good go to work, but limited by the universal laws, so it is a process that takes time. In the end, always win. It's like war. War starts with a huge devastation caused by evil. Then it takes a year, two years, three years, five years. Second World War took five years to wrap up. 
they could have they could have finished it in two days by being just as evil as the evil that started it. But forces for good, they can because they have a conscience. Because they have, knowingly or unknowingly, a foundation of moral principles. If you look at history, the good always wins, always prevails, but it takes time. If you understand that, just look forward to a new era after the evil has been dispatched of. And it will happen again. Don't be surprised. It will happen again. It's a constant process. Two steps forward, one step back. People have a tendency to be very pessimistic. But if you see the process at work, if you're able to see the process at work, there's no need to be pessimistic. Of course, it's sad that there, is a lot of, there are a lot of people suffering from all that is happening. But if you look at the process, you see that there is, like on a personal level, on a societal level, on a global level, there is a constant process of growth, evolution, development. And there's evil involved. There is, there is bad involved. Unavoidably. Try to look at it for what it is. Do not allow yourself to be dragged into conspiracy theories or, or pessimism. But contribute to a better world by being a better person yourself. And Yamas and Niyamas lay the foundation for that. Okay? Questions? How do you see like, the um, changes of like, environment and energy before Corona and after Corona? Like, like an area of class like we discuss about the harmony. Yeah. Do you consider like Corona as a harmony to this uh, war or not? Yeah, Corona is quite a complex issue. I think the reality of what has happened will only become clear after 10, 20 years or so. <laughs> there are things at work here, uh, political, evil, um, that cannot even be spoken of. So, but it's the same. It's part of a process. It's part of the process of two step forward, one step back. Um, it's part of an awakening process on a global scale. Um, It's, it's part, yeah, it's part of an awakening process. The, 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 we have ended up in a situation because of greed, because of, we, we have ignored many things that were wrong in global relationships, trade and what have you, justified even, evil things, bad things, incorrect things, like theft and lies and what have you, with an with a, with a economical motive. The economic motive overruled the justified motive, the, the, the overruled all the evil that was committed. And now we pay a very heavy price for that. And Corona is, is part of that. Whether it is natural or whether it was created in a laboratorium, uh, it's part of that. Like, as a like, personal experience, I just want to know that like, do you have now after Corona? Do you feel like uh, better? I mean, in terms of like energy, for example, like for my for my case and like some some of uh, like my friends, like before Corona, like we were talking that like the world is going so fast and like economy uh, problem this kind of thing, and we always you know wish that like this is it should be stopped in some certain uh, like period. And suddenly, like, you know, uh, we still find like, the corona. Like, like, <laughs> yeah. So, like, the corona, you know, rise up and the, uh, you know, that uh, access to, and uh, suddenly, you know, reduce. 
And I think that like the vibration totally in the uh, like airplane so has to change because like the uh, like movement of people, you know, really is and the people are uh, isolated. Yeah, it's very complex. There are people who benefit, <coughs> actually progress because of the virus, but they're also suffering. There are many people losing their jobs, for example, their businesses. Um, people from the Netherlands uh, I communicate with tell me that actually there's a huge operation going on now, people learning new skills. After many years of being in a certain profession, they, they just lose their job and for the foreseeable future, there's not going to be employment in that in that in that profession, and they, they really have to totally. It's a drama. It's a big drama. It doesn't seem so big a drama because governments have they have poured in huge amount of money, which 14 years ago, for example, they had not available. But the, the especially the industrialized world has such huge amounts of money to pour in basically creating a false economy. Well, we're going to have to pay back for that for the next 20, 30 years. Don't make a mistake about that. This is going to impact uh, uh, the, the world uh, economy, society, and with that people's well-being for decades to come. Trillions of dollars of created wealth, basically, have been poured in. It stabilizes things to some extent, but there is payback for this. It, it has a huge impact on, on everything and everybody. If I feel different, I actually, I feel very blessed. Strange. One thing, we're in Korea. Korea is one of the countries that did a really good <coughs> job at containing the virus. That's one thing. Um, but you know, in 2019, I took a break for one year. I just decided to, I need a break. So I stopped teaching. Athena actually uh, registered for the course 2019, and I contacted the people that registered that I'm, I'm going to take a break. I, the course is not going to take place. Was there like any but, specific reason for that one? What? Was there any specific reason like, you decided not to? All, all, the, all the signals were there. I kind of... Actually, I thought I'm never going to teach yoga anymore. Uh, wow. No, no, no. I, was, I felt I'm at the end of my rope. I'm, I'm done. I'm, I just needed a break. Maybe it has something to do with age or... But things developed also in a way that I felt I was losing control or, um, I don't know. If you are in a situation where you constantly have to feel that you're rowing against the stream, there comes a point, you, you, you know what you're doing and you know that it's good to, to, to you know, keep yourself together, do what you have to do with, with the, you know, with a good attitude and, uh, and uh, what I teach also here. When I'm in trouble, I talk to myself like I would talk to a student in trouble. So, it was in uh, January, um, this dog appeared in the park and it was the time that I, I changed the venue also. Um, it's very complex, but I, I really had a feeling I'm done. I, actually, I think I was burned out. I was, I was exhausted. I was not motivated anymore. So, this dog is a wild dog, and I really felt connected with him. And that justified for me my decision to not start the next course because in the beginning stages this dog was so unstable he couldn't stay alone. So I'm a, I'm, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a yogi, I'm a shaman. <laughs> 
the universe tells you what you need to do. If you don't listen, you suffer. And that this dog appeared in the park, and me connecting with that dog, uh, that was a sign of the universe. I had a dog that died in the summer of 2015, after 15 years, 2018. And I said, I'm never going to have a dog again. It was, it was really painful. I was still, I was still, I was still suffering from that. When half a year later, um, anyway, but then Pada came, and uh, it was obvious. If I had not taken him in, I would today I would have regretted it. I probably I would not even have started teaching. So I started just focusing on the dog and taking care of myself in the meantime. A couple of months later, I found out he has a sister who's still in the shelter, so I took her in too. And his sister was much worse than Pada. The first three months that she was in my house, I couldn't touch her. So that means also I couldn't walk her. So she destroyed everything. My bed and uh, the electricity cables and... Uh, and I just, without, without complaining, without uh, getting angry, I just, I just managed everything. Two times, three times a day, she would pee on my bed. So I, my neighbors were asking me, why, why always your, your, your bedding is hanging out on the, on the, on the, on the pop door, on the, on the veranda? So I was really busy. <laughs> but I know. The condition that they were in requires patience and love and routine. So I never raised my voice, never, I just did what I had to do, knowing that in the long term everything will be fine. And that's exactly what happened. And then the universe provided me with Neda. Neda calls me one day and she said, Hey Ron, I'm in Yangche and I'm with Mr. Han. Mr. Han also has a studio in Yoido, and he says you can use it. That was in December. So I started to smile. The dogs had just become stable. I knew that I, I'd leave, I would leave them alone for an hour to go to the supermarket. I thought, yeah, the universe wants me. I started to feel enthusiasm again. I started to feel inspiration again. So I said, okay. Let me go and have a look. And I walked here, because it's not so far from my home. And while I was walking, I, I very clearly remember my thought processes. I thought, either it's not meant to be, then I'll just wait another half year. Because most studios are actually small, half the size of this one. And that's not fit for my purpose. So, kind of a little bit skeptical, I thought, well, it's probably too small, so then it's not meant to be. But the moment I walked in here, it was clear. <laughs> Such a wonderful, big, wide place and close to home. I want to stay in Yoido, close to home, because of the dogs. I live here. So, all the energy started flowing again. I started feeling really good again. So I put out an event on Facebook and people reacted and, and 24 people, 25 people showed up in the first course. Then COVID came, everybody just continued coming to class. One person dropped out from the American army because they're not allowed to go off base anymore. And one person dropped out because her parents didn't allow her to come because of the virus. But for the rest, everybody kept showing up. You know, these are all things that, that really, for me, that's a sign of the universe. And, and moreover, this course, I expected uh, much less students, actually, because of the virus. And I'm really grateful for all of you showing up here, because it's, there are 23 students. That's the universe at work, you know? Yeah. yeah.
It sounds maybe foolish or naive, but I, I, I struggled all my young life until I started to connect. Things started to make sense and I became more and more reliant on not what I want, but what the universe wants. And when you, when you do that, it seems counterintuitive, but it leads to incredible developments. You know, when I met the dog, people from the neighborhood told me, no, no, don't. Are you crazy? This wild dog and looks like a wolf and you're single and, and so no way that I was going to let him go. But there are many people in the park with their own dogs and they sometimes they brought some snacks, but nobody was seriously doing anything to, to rescue that dog or to um, alleviate uh, his suffering. So you can imagine what happened when I came with the idea that I was going to adopt his sister also. That's not a good idea. <laughs> you already have one. But when I discovered his sister, I found out that Pada, they, they were born in a park, in a World Cup, World Cup Stadium park. They were born there, four siblings and a mom. After four months, they were rescued and put in a shelter. Two siblings were very early on adopted, so there was only Pada and Bobby. Half a year later, Pada was adopted and Bobby was alone. Bobby didn't eat anymore, didn't play anymore with other doggies, and nobody could handle her anymore. So they just left her in her cage 24 hours a day. With other dogs, they do activities. Volunteers come to take them out for a walk in the park. A Bobby stayed in the cage. Pada, four days after adoption, ran away from his new home. He escaped. And he ended up in the park, middle in the winter, it was 15 degrees below zero. Now if you look at the map, and you draw a line from his adopted home, to the park, to the shelter, it becomes clear that he was on his way back to Bobby. So he missed his sister, he escaped and was basically on his way. And his sister, when I, when I, met her, she was half dead. And the shelter has a non-euthanization policy, so they don't euthanize dogs. So basically they were just waiting for her to die in her misery. Maybe as a person that's not so conscious and sensitive, you don't see all that, but I see all these connections. So it's impossible not to take his sister also. And you know, the moment Bobby came home, Pata totally changed to me. You know, he treated me as a stranger. He was with me three months. If I would go into the room, he would, he would avoid me going to another room. If I would go to bed, then he would go out and sleep somewhere else. In, at night he would sneak in again, but the moment I would turn around, he would, poof, he would go out. The, the day Bobby came home, he lied down on his bed and he wanted me to rub him. The three months that Pata was alone, I just, because I've had dogs all my life, I wanted to cuddle him. I wanted, I liked that, I loved that, and he wouldn't. The day Bobby came home, he totally opened up to me. And not only that, I have a video that he starts He's so happy that Bobby came home. He's just going out of his mind. While Bobby is still very nervous because it's a new environment. She has no idea what is happening. Of course, she's happy Pada is there, but very stiff and she couldn't be at, but you know, they broke down my house the days after. They're so happy being together again. For me, that is everything. And I'm busy, it's almost a full-time job, but I, it, every day they make me happy. 
And it inspires me to teach again. It inspires me to be my best self again. I had given up two years ago. So if I would follow what I want, I would not have gone to the park and do my best to... I went there every day with a backpack, with this backpack, with fresh water, canned meat, dry food, and snacks. Bonding with Pada, hoping that I, he would allow me to put a leash on. He didn't. I did that for two months. And then he started crossing the road into the apartment uh, neighborhood. So it became dangerous. I became a little bit desperate. So I ordered, or people helped me to order a, a cage, a po hector in Korea, po hector, a, a trap. So we, we put this trap there with, with delicious food and, and stopped feeding him. And after three days, he was so hungry, he went inside. <laughs> it turned my life upside down. But I needed that. I don't complain. It, it's actually a wonderful journey. But if you don't listen to the universe, you'll never experience that. If you do what you feel you do. My life does not exist about what I want to do, because every time I try to do what I want to do, I end up suffering, failing, conflict, misery. If I just do my duty, which is given to me by the universe, people may call it God, I don't, I don't like that word so much, then everything, everything goes smooth. And that, for me, that's what life is about. And that's why my teaching is also very different from other yoga courses. It's really about the essence in a very practical way. And if you remember, you know, that dog causes that, you know, I'm here. <laughs> that dog causes what? That I'm here. The reason that I'm here just, you know, I feel that, you know, your dog is very friendly and that causes, you know, I make a conversation with you. And then he, right, right, right. Oh, <laughs> I, I, I met Ali on the riverside. I was walking my dogs, and Ali was walking there with a colleague, and just just came into a conversation with each other. And the next day, he came to the workshop. <laughs> and the interesting thing is that, like, right before we were discussing about, like, you know, how we can, you know, arrange and, you know, increase our energy, and then, like, suddenly, you know, I mean, you. I forgot about that. You, you, you met Pada in Bali. Yeah. 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 For me, that's. I think you feel the same. Because you sent me a message and you said, hey, I really have to talk with you because I have some really special thing to share with you. <laughs> that's what happens when you connect with the universe. There is, there is no coincidence in life. Everything is destined. When you connect with that, things start... You go on a journey and it doesn't matter. You know, home is where the heart is. People take that expression and they create a very cozy home with nice furniture and ding dongs on the wall. Uh, what do you call it? Uh, decorations and things and nice lighting. Home is where the heart is, cozy. But home is where the heart is, goes much deeper. Because home is where the heart is, means you feel home when you connect with the heart. Wherever that is, if you're connected with the heart and that brings you to the moon, you will be happy living on the moon or in Siberia or in the high on the mountains in Himalaya. For me, that became Korea. The universe brought me here. And most of you as well, I'm sure. Right? And eventually it brought you here. <laughs> Yoga by Ron. <laughs> if I take over the studio, I only have to remove those. <laughs> Take a little break. <laughs> Start with Asana. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.